What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites. I'm glad to officially be back after a little bit of time off. Some of you might have seen on the community tab that I recently lost my dad. I didn't really have time to speak about it in last Sunday's episode about Cameron Robbins because I wanted to get that episode out quite quickly, but I wanted to thank you all for your incredibly kind messages and it means so much to me to have the support of you Shark Bites subscribers. At some point, I'm gonna tell you a story about my dad and the first time that we ever saw a wild shark but I'm gonna save that for another day. I wanted to get back to making videos relatively quickly though, because I love making these Shark Bites episodes. I think it's important for me to continue doing something like this because working hard and making videos is gonna be a really good distraction for me. Yeah, it's gonna be tough and I do feel pretty shitty right now. And undoubtedly it's gonna take a few takes for me to get through these episodes. Although luckily you're not gonna to have to see those because of these handy jump cuts. All in all, I love making these videos and I love talking about sharks, but I'm gonna need all of your help and support to help get me through. But the great thing is we have such a good community of people here on Shark Bites. So I know that most of you out there have got my back. Today though, we're gonna have a little bit of a deeper look into that zebra shark rewilding project that I spoke to you guys about a few weeks ago in that creature feature. Make sure to click that link there though, by the way, if you haven't seen it. There was a bunch of you in the comments though that were really keen to hear a little bit more about this zebra shark reintroduction project. So today we're gonna to talk a bit about shark rewilding and whether this could be a valuable tool to try and help shark pop populations recover in different parts of the world. I will admit though, I'm not a rewilding specialist. I've never taken part in a shark reintroduction and this isn't really my area of shark science. But I did learn a fair bit about it back when I was studying my degree and I always found it really, really interesting. First up though, we've got to take a look at rewilding and what it actually is. So in its broadest form, rewilding is restoring an area to its natural and uncultivated state. In most cases, it's about taking a step back and letting nature take care of itself. For example, you might have a back garden where you've just got a bit of grass and you're constantly cutting it. If you were to rewild that garden, you would stop cutting the grass and let it grow back and maybe plant some wild flowers. And this in turn then brings in the insects like bees and butterflies and that then brings in the birds and the bats and so on and so forth. You get the picture. So part of rewilding is taking a step back and letting nature do its thing. But under the umbrella of rewilding comes reintroductions. And that's where we take a species of wild animal that's been driven out or exterminated from an area and carefully plonk it back into that habitat. And we do this in the hope that it will bring back a healthy population of that species. And it also might contribute to helping other species within that ecosystem as well. I imagine most of you will have heard about rewildings or reintroductions before. They always seem to make the news because it's a pretty big topic, but they can also be a pretty controversial topic as well. I imagine most of the ones you've heard about before will be terrestrial based reintroductions. And the big one for you guys over there in North America is probably wolves. Back in the mid 90s, Yellowstone National Park was reported to have no wolves left, but a rampant population of elk led to the reintroduction of 14 Canadian wolves. I think as of 2016, there's now over a hundred wolves. So the reintroduction clearly worked. Other examples you might have heard of as well include bison in the Netherlands and beavers here in the UK. I love those little furry buggers. So we can see that at least from a terrestrial standpoint, rewilding and reintroductions have been pretty commonplace over the last two decades at least. But the ocean is a different story. Okay, we do have marine protected areas, which to an extent is a form of rewilding. MPAs I suppose could be considered as rewilding because by stopping detrimental activities in that area, i.e. fishing, you'd hope that that area would then begin to recover. Which, as we learned earlier, standing back and letting nature do its thing is a form of rewilding. MPAs do have their own issues though, and they have certain criteria that they have to meet for them to be successful. Some of which include being large in size or being enforced by humans. But you can see how sometimes if you have an MPA that's either tens or hundreds of square kilometers in size, it might be pretty tricky to enforce that area and make sure that people who enter that area aren't doing things they're not supposed to be doing. So at the moment, rewilding the oceans has mainly focused on creating these MPAs, stepping back and letting nature do its thing. There have been a few success stories in the ocean though by reintroducing vegetation. One of those success stories immediately springs to mind. I think it's in North Wales where they are growing seagrass seeds in aquariums and then planting those seeds in the ocean, which is definitely gonna result in environmental positives. There's other ones as well in the Netherlands, I think, where they are building oyster reefs and then introducing young oysters to try and boost that population. So here you can see that ocean rewilding is well and truly still in its infancy. Yes, there's been a few cases with vegetation and some other cases with shellfish species, but it's never really been done before with large marine animals like it has been done in terrestrial habitats. But as lots of you will have alluded from the title, 
all, this episode is going to be about sharks. And it turns out now, rewilding has officially entered the shark realm. I did briefly mention this in the zebra shark creature feature that we did a few weeks ago, so make sure you go and watch that video as well. It's really cool. Anyway, I'm going to dive into this zebra shark reintroduction project in a little bit more depth for you. So ReShark is an internationally backed project that is aiming to bolster the population of zebra sharks in Indonesia, specifically in Raja Ampat. It's a huge collaborative effort from scientists and aquariums across the world where they are raising zebra shark pups in aquariums and then releasing those pups in the marine protected area in Raja Ampat. The plan is to release over 500 of the juvenile sharks over the next several years to try and boost that population. The idea is that they're released into a highly protected area and that means that they can survive and make it to adulthood and then they can start reproducing and then that boosts the population over time. But the question is, is this going to work for zebra sharks? And then can it be replicated for other endangered shark species in different parts of the world? So first, let's have a look at whether this is even going to work for the zebra sharks. And to do that, we've got to know a little bit more about their life histories and their behavior. Wow, this is creature feature round two for zebra sharks. So the first big ones are their reproductive rates and their lifespan. For zebra sharks, it's thought that they become sexually mature somewhere around the age of six to eight years old. Admittedly, this is in captivity, but it's a really, really difficult thing to work out for wild animals. And in terms of their lifespan, they're thought to live around 26 to 28 years old. So you've got an animal there that theoretically can reproduce for around 20 years. In captivity, the average number of offspring that a female zebra shark can produce sits at around five per year. Obviously, there is going to be a range in this number, and we do have to take into account that it is from captivity, so situations in the wild could be slightly different. So doing some quick maths here, if you released 500 zebra shark individuals, 250 males and 250 females, and all of those individuals reached sexual maturity, then each year those 250 females each had five successful hatchlings, then you've got 1,250 zebra shark pups per year. And if they can reproduce for 20 years, years, that's 1250 times 20, which totals 25,000 zebra sharks in the next 30 years. Maths. Now, that's some very simplistic maths calculations there. In reality, it's not going to work out like that at all. For starters, they're not releasing 500 all in one go. They're doing it over several years, but you get the idea. On the face of it, those are some pretty big numbers, but we have to look at a few different factors as well. So another big one is looking at their movement patterns. Are zebra sharks a more resident species that stays around a particular area, or are they more transient and migratory? Well, at the moment, we're not entirely sure because it looks to be a little bit of a mix. In certain studies, some some zebra sharks have been recited on the same reef over the space of a few years, so that would suggest that they are somewhat resident. But in the study that I'm referring to there, it was only 26% of zebra sharks that were recited. That's less than a third. So that tells us that some zebra sharks like to stick around an area and others clearly head off to different areas. And this is going to be one of the major deciding factors in the success of this zebra shark project. Are the zebra sharks going to stay in the protected waters of Raja Ampat? or are the zebra sharks gonna head out to the unprotected waters? If enough of them stay, great they'll be safe in those waters. The waters of Raja Ampat are patrolled by the Raja Ampat Marine Park Authority. These badass dudes in their blue camo patrol the waters of the MPAs within Raja Ampat and make sure that everyone who is there is doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're basically checking vessel permits and making sure that tourists have paid their entry fee for the marine park. But they're also there making sure that no one is performing destructive activities. And I definitely wouldn't want to muck around with these guys. So if the sharks stay, it's a pretty sure bet that they'll be safe at least from human activities. But once they leave the confines of Raja Ampat, which some sharks will definitely do, they'll no longer be under the protection of those patrols and can be fished and killed. This is the big one, and I don't know the answer. I don't know how many of those sharks will stay and how many of those sharks will leave. But the great thing about this zebra shark reintroduction project is that it is very much scientifically based. The idea for the project was discussed all the way back in 2014, so it's taken nearly 10 years for them to get to the point where they're releasing the first sharks into the water. And this is because in all that time, lots of things were going on behind the scenes. A lot of it was organizing all the collaborators, but a major part of it was making sure that the science was sound. Scientists made sure to input all of these factors that we've spoken about today and some other factors into models. And those models were able to produce outputs that will hopefully make this project not only viable, but successful. I'm pretty sure that's where they've come up with the 500 number as that's the number that's needed to make sure enough individuals survive and get to the point where they can reproduce to keep that population healthy. I'm going to go out on a whim here and give this a shark bites prediction. 
I think this is going to work at least in Raja Ampat. If you think this project's also going to work, make sure you let me know in the comments below. I'm super keen to hear all of your thoughts on this. Oh, and while you're down there, maybe give the video a like. It really does help out the channel. <laughs> right, back on topic. The question that still remains is, could this work elsewhere and could it work for other shark species? One of the major reasons why I think it's going to work in Raja Ampat is because of just how protected that area is. I can't really think of another MPA in the world that has as stringent protection measures as Raja Ampat does. With a lot of other MPAs, like I said earlier, it's really difficult to ensure that they're protected because you need teams of people patrolling large swathes of water, making sure no one's breaking the rules. And in other MPAs, sometimes that enforcement just isn't there. How do you protect an MPA that is hundreds of square kilometers in size? It's almost impossible. It's not like you can stick a big fence around it with signs that say keep out. And that's going to be one of the limiting factors for making this work in other parts of the world. In regards to other shark species, they're going to have to meet a bunch of different criteria for it to work for them. It's unlikely that we'll ever see this happen for say great white sharks or other pelagic open ocean shark species because these sharks don't tend to do well in aquarium settings and don't produce their offspring in eggs. Vivivora shark species, that's shark species that produce live offspring, will always struggle in projects like this, simply because it's incredibly difficult to transport live offspring around the world. One of the big reasons this zebra shark project was able to get off the ground is because zebra shark eggs could fairly easily be transported to Raja Ampat. So I think rewilding and reintroduction of shark species, at least for the time being, is going to be limited to certain species of egg-laying shark, and also limited to certain parts of the world that are high highly protected. Until we start strictly enforcing MPAs, there's no point releasing a bunch of juvenile sharks into them because the likelihood of them surviving, even in an MPA, might still be quite low. But this is the start. We're still in the infancy of all this and I do actually think it's a very exciting project. With more work and more collaboration, we could start to see a bunch of different egg-laying shark species used in examples like this. And if it works, the zebra shark project will forever be used as a case study of which future attempts at shark rewilding can be based on. If we can save threatened shark species in this way, then I wholeheartedly agree that we should be doing so. But it's obviously going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, and really importantly, it has to be scientifically thought out beforehand. I do think there is another example of shark rewilding somewhere here in the UK, but for the life of me, I can't find it anywhere. I'm sure it was in Wales here in the UK. I remember reading about it a good few months ago on Twitter, and I think it involved bullhuss or small spotted cat sharks. I'm not sure. So those species aren't particularly threatened threatened, at least not in the same way that zebra sharks are, but I think that is another example of shark rewilding. So if any of you have seen that or saw it on Twitter somewhere, please do send it across to me because I can't find it. Speaking of threatened sharks though, if you've ever wondered what the biggest threat to sharks is, then you're going to want to click on this video right here where I talk to you all about them. And I've even ranked them for you. So make sure you click on it right here. Spoiler alert though, it's not shark finning.